The Louis T. Network is powered by Music Head University. Music Heads, classes in session. Turn me up. Enroll on YouTube now. Link is in the description. Who else could it be? For me, your man, Louis T. Welcome to the Command Post Live. You know what it is. Post up. Take command. I, of course, am your Commander-in-Chief, Louis T. Thank you for joining me. On this Louis T Network exclusive Draft Prospects 101 series, top seven edge rushers of the 2024 NFL Draft. It's a very intriguing group because, as I mentioned to you guys before on a different show, it's not a ton of production with this group. You're, you're not basing your intrigue off of tangible evidence that this guy can do it at a high level. You're basing a lot of these projections off of measurables and and upside and that can be scary sometimes but i think of all the positions in the draft especially on the defensive side of the football edge rusher is one of those positions that you have to be able to project the most and you have to be able to coach up because rarely do edge rushers come into the league polished ready to go right out of the packaging and have hand usage and an arsenal of moves that they know how to dispatch um they they're usually guys don't come with a rush plan equipped going into the league that, that's for a select few and you get excited when you see guys that actually have a rush plan that actually have three moves and then a counter to one of their better moves. You get excited because generally in college football, guys win off of pure ability, physicality, athleticism, or just flat out being better than the competition. And so when you get to the NFL level where everybody's talented and these tackles are very schooled and it's a lot tougher. So, I think this draft is going to be fascinating to see how teams how and, and I think we've kind of seen that over the last few years. It I think it's a a science that continues to be flawed because I myself I put a lot more stock in the guys that come into the league polished. You may not be the most explosive and dynamic rusher, but there's something to be said about guys that just know how to get to the to the quarterback. Uh, that said, there's also something to be said about being explosive and dynamic. And if you can figure it out, you can be a problem at the NFL level. But so many times we've seen guys like Tack McKinley come into the league with an explosive first step and and just raw as the day is long and just never figures it out. Right. We see it all the time with these types of edge rushers. Um, I can't remember the guy that the Jets took in the first round out of Ohio State many, many, many years ago. Boy, did he suck ass. I mean, uh, generally speaking, if you don't have a plan for an edge rusher who's super talented but really doesn't have a rush arsenal or plan, you're going to find yourself holding the bill of a first round pick that you spent and you're not going to get the value out of it. So you have to be very, very careful. As a wise man once said, be very, very careful. But I think it's a nice blend this group is of guys with high level um, talent and traits and then a, a guy, a few guys sprinkled in that have production and the talent to match. So let's get to the list and see um, how I have these guys rated. And then you can tell me where I went wrong, um, what am I missing, et cetera, et cetera. And um, we can get to the comment section uh, a little bit later on. But let's dive in. Shall we? So, you know, when I start feeling listy, 
I start listing things and my list are often comprised of seven items. And thus, this is no different. We get to our edge rusher list and we start with number seven and it is Marshawn Neeland, the edge rusher out of Western um, Michigan. Now, Marshawn Neeland is interesting. He's very intriguing, man, because I think a lot of people were excited about the combine performance he turned in. Um, showed off some athleticism. And then when you watch the tape, he's an interesting study because I don't actually know what his fit is at, at the NFL level. I'm still trying to figure that out. Is he a outside linebacker in a 3-4 defense? The key is capable of doing that, but I don't think he's explosive enough to be that. But I've seen guys at his size find a way to make it work, like a Lamar Woodley, for instance. Um, but that was a different NFL, right? Is he a hand-in-the-dirt defensive end in a base 4-3 defense in an even front? I don't know about that. Not quite sure about that. Can he be reduced inside? Sure, he can be on, on obvious passing downs. But where I think he shines the most, coincidentally enough, is when you stand him up, when he's in a two-point stance and he's walking around, you know, he's all over the place, he's standing up, and he's allowed to just kind of be aggressive from an upright stance. I think he's less effective with his hand in the dirt, which is kind of a juxtaposition with him. You got to figure out where this guy is best utilized because right now he's like a move piece defensively, which is very intriguing for defenses that kind of try to create a positionless, you know, package where you got all kinds of athletes on the field and, you know, all of these guys can get to the quarterback and none of them are over 280 pounds, you know, 290, um, which – we, we, we see teams do that sometimes in the NFL where you go to a straight NASCAR type package where you're trying to get to the quarterback and uh, he'd be a guy that would fit perfectly in a system like that or a scheme that has a package set aside for a, a guy to get to the quarterback in that regard. Um, he can put his hand in the dirt, but I think he's more effective standing up, which is, which is interesting. Um, I, I, I see so much, in him, uh, 6'3", 267. Let me start there. Um, 47540. That 6'3 comes equipped with some length. I think he's got some 33 and some change inch arms. So it, it it he has what you're looking for. I think he's one of those guys that has what you're looking for. Uh, from that standpoint, with, with the the arm length at nearly 270. He could probably put on another seven, eight pounds, put his hand in the dirt. I mean, you could put your hand in the dirt in a base four three at two sixty seven. Dudes do it all the time. Um, but I I wonder what his fit is gonna be. I'm I'm actually intrigued where his fit is in the NFL. Is he better in an odd front standing up? Is he better in an even front hand in the dirt? Not for me to decide. The talent is definitely there. He's he's very explosive for a guy his size, right? Plays hard, uses his hands well, good change of direction. Be interested to see where he ends up and how he's utilized at the next level. My comp for him, I struggle with a comp for him because on one hand, again, I, I told you, you could see some, some Lamar Woodley-esque movement skills out of him and you could see him potentially being a Lamar Woodley type guy. And I think that's probably the closest comp I have, but at the same time, I see a lot of Brandon Graham in him as well. Now Graham is more along the lines of your traditional defensive lineman hand in the dirt. Graham's claim to fame was you can kick him inside, reduce him inside and he could win with quickness against you know, the bigger guards inside, slower guards inside. Um, Nealon, I think, could have that same ability, but 
at 267 pounds, you can only get away with that in, in a in a package where it's an obvious passing situation and you're trying to create mismatches, right? So Nealon is interesting. Nealon is interesting. Um, I want to see where he ends up. So he's number seven on my list. Coming in at number six is Chop Robinson. 6'3", 254 pounds. The junior ran a 4'4", 840, which is absolutely blazing at the 2024 NFL Scouting Combine. Um, we know Penn State is known for producing high-level athletes, if nothing else. Guys that come out of Penn State, and I've talked about this numerous times, I don't know who their strength and conditioning coach is, but whatever he's being paid isn't nearly enough. If he's not the highest paid strength and conditioning coach in the nation, then he needs to fire his agent and renegotiate because what he's able to do with these athletes is ridiculous. But Chop Robinson is a guy that I think is going to be polarizing in this draft. And we've talked about could he slip in the draft? Very possible because the production just simply is not there. However, upon saying that, at this position, and I, this is why I mentioned this at the top of the show, this isn't about production. You'd love to have it, but it's not a necessity. When you're talking about edge rushers, because of the nature of the position and the, the level of athletes that exist in college football, sometimes you just want the blank canvas, the guy with the athletic profile and the tools necessary to get it done, and you'll figure out the rest. That's where coaching comes into play. I had somebody tell me that Chop Robinson is Michael Parsons. And I laughed. Like, <laughs> you shouldn't be, right? Like, there's no way he's he's Michael Parsons. Like, from an athletic profile standpoint, sure. Size, he's bigger than him. Speed-wise, I think Michael ran a 4-3 something, though. He ran something ridiculous. Uh, and Michael was like 240. So there was definitely a difference there. But for Chop Robinson to be 6'3", 255 pounds to run a 4'4", is ridiculous. But there is absolutely zero skill involved in what Chop Robinson does as a pass rusher. Now, he's explosive. He's dynamic. And that first step, there's a, a rep. I'm trying to recall the game that I was watching. And I, I think it was Michigan. And there's a rep where he blows right by the tackle before he even gets out of his stance. And I, I looked, I remember rewinding it like three times because I was like, he's got to be off sides. There's no way he timed that up that perfectly. And he got out of his, you know, stance before the tackle could even move. And he was already by him. And it was at that point where I said, that right there is why Chop Robinson will probably be drafted in the first round. It's that play right there in particular, because you can't coach that. It's that type of speed that's going to scare a tackle shitless into opening up those hips and opening up that gate to the inside. And if he can just come up with a counter, a Euro step back inside, a crossover, anything, a swim, a quick swim, a spin, anything that, because he's so explosive to the edge, you're going to have to get out of that stance and get ready. And if you can then counter off that, if he can find a way to just, look, you've got a fastball. If you can just get one pitch off of the fastball, he's got something. He doesn't use his hands that well. He's not great in the run game. I've watched this guy get devoured and swallowed up in the run game. Um, there's a lot there to tap into, but you got to figure out how you want to utilize this guy and, and what his best role and fit is at the next level. Because as a base, you know, four, three defensive end, I don't see it. I think he's more of a fit in an odd front as an outside backer. I think you can unleash him there. And he could be problematic in a situation where he's standing up, rushing from a two-point stance. But 
I think he's scheme dependent. I think he is a guy that needs to be in an odd front, needs to go to a Pittsburgh, needs to go somewhere where he's going to have a chance to stand up on every snap and rush from as an outside backer. You know, I think that's where his calling card at the next level is probably going to be. I don't love him with his hand in the dirt. But when you watch him be explosive, a lot of it comes with his hand in the dirt. But he's not good enough against the the tackles and those guards in the ring game. That's why you want him in an odd front because you want him taking on tight ends. You, I like that matchup a lot better than I do him going against a tackle. You want him going against that tight end. So, again, super toolsy. Tons of explosiveness and athleticism. Limited production and next to no skill whatsoever involved in what he's doing right now. Coaching is of the utmost importance when you talk Chop Robinson. My cop for him is Vic Beasley coming out of Clemson. Um, remember, Vic, Vic came in super explosive, dynamic. Now, the difference was Vic came in with all kinds of collegiate production. He was ready to go right out of the pa packaging. With the word go, he was ready at the NFL level, but he never really materialized into what we thought he was going to be. But he did have that one season in like 2016, did Vic Beasley. He did have that one year. You can't take it away from him. Led the NFL with like 15 and a half sacks. There is that one year, and it could be in there with Chop Robinson too. Could be in there with Chop Robinson too. We'll see what happens. But um, he's my sixth best rusher in this draft. I, people are going to fall in love with the explosiveness and the dynamic ability. I need some sort of skill. I need something. I've seen too many guys come in this league who are explosive, who can get up the field with no sense of direction, no ability to stop the run, and those guys don't last very long. And that's Chop Robinson right now. That's Chop Robinson. So we'll see what he ends up being. Number five. Sticking with the Robinsons. Meet the Robinsons. It's Darius Robinson. Edge rusher from Mizzou, 6'5", 285, ran a 4'9", 540. Uh, he's a little bit different. He's cut different. He's built different. And he's, again, scheme dependent. Can you put him with his hand in the dirt and even front as a base 4'3 defensive end? Sure. Sure you can. But he's going to be better suited to go somewhere where – they're either going to move him around and allow him to play inside and outside. Maybe he'll be able to capture the edge at the NFL level um, as a, a base, you know, four, three defensive end. But I think where he'll probably find his best success is in an odd front as a base three, four defensive end as a five tech and somewhere like Baltimore, like Pittsburgh, I think he'd be better suited for a team like that. Um, but somebody may give him a chance to be a base 4-3 defensive end. Obviously, he had his best season of his career when he was finally kicked outside and given an opportunity to rush as a defensive end. But I still think he does his best work as in de a defensive tackle, as an interior guy that can capture the edge against guards. Quickness inside, winning against those guys who aren't uh, as fleet of foot, who don't have the twitchiness inside. So um, if you are going to draft him as a 4-3 uh, you know, defensive football team, then it has to be a team that has the ability to kick him inside, like a San Francisco 49ers, for instance. He'd fit perfectly in what they do defensively and schematically. Um, he'd fit really good in, in, in what they ask their defensive tackles to do. And so I'd be interested to see um, – where he ends up, I will say that upon watching more tape of him, he was a little bit more impressive than I gave him credit for. Still not my cup of tea, but he's definitely a guy that has some ability and can be a difference maker at the next level if, again, put in the right position to succeed. Um, my comp for him right now is – Di uh, Dio um, Adangbo, Dio Adangbo, who 
I think went to Vandy, was drafted out of Vandy by the Indianapolis Colts. Took Dio a little while to figure it out, but people felt like he had this type of ability coming out. I, and again, I wasn't a Dio or Dangbo fan, even though I saw some of the twitchiness, I saw some of the ability. Um, I just wasn't a big fan of his. Uh, I've seen people comp him to Keon White, who came out. Uh, a year or two ago, drafted in either the first or second round by the New England Patriots. There's no way he's Darry, he's Keon White. Keon White was way more explosive than Darius Robinson ever uh, will was, is, or will be. Um, but I think he is Dio uh, Odangbo. And Dio Odangbo, I think, had eight or nine sacks this year for the Indianapolis Colts. So he's figuring this shit out. And I think it's only a matter of time before Darius Robinson, who just had his first season really as a defensive end. It's only a matter of time before he figures the shit out. And if he figures it out and he's able to put it together, he could end up being a guy that has a very productive NFL career ahead of him. So uh, my comp for Darius Robinson is Dio Odangbo. And um, almost to the exact T, same height, same weight, same ability. Uh, I think Odangbo might have been a little bit more um, – explosive and dynamic from an athletic profile but um i think robinson when it's all said and done has a chance to be a really good uh pass rusher especially from the interior if you ask me i know a lot of people you know like some of the tape at, at defensive end uh, i like his ability to capture the edge uh, on the interior on guards on centers splitting double teams getting into the backfield so he's my number five number four is Austin Booker. I am a sucker for explosive guys that show me a skill set that translates to the NFL level with a bevy of moves and a motor that just won't quit. And that explains who Austin Booker is in a nutshell. I told you guys uh, about four or five days ago uh, when Washington first added him to the list of guys who would be coming in for a visit that I did my homework and I was blown away you know, by what this guy could potentially be. Now, he's extremely raw, 6'4", 240, very undersized, clearly. So you have to have a plan for him. I think he's he's got a frame that stands to get bigger, and I think he could put on anywhere from 8 to 12 pounds over the next year or two. And I wouldn't be shocked if we look up in two years and Austin Booker's 255 pounds, 252 pounds, right? And that's his new playing weight. He's not going to lose any athleticism or, or quickness because I actually was disappointed in his 40 time. To be honest, if you watch the tape, you're expecting much more explosive and dynamic time than 479. This guy's a red shirt sophomore. Had he gone back to school and did what I think he was capable of doing, um, who knows what the Big 12 is now with Texas leaving and going to the SEC? I don't know where Kansas is in all of this, if they're still in the Big 12 and who's still remaining there and who's now in the Big 12. Other teams might have come from other conferences. Whatever the case may be, he probably could have dominated the, the Big 12 if Kansas is still there and uh, been, you know, Big 12 player of the year, defensive player of the year type of guy. Um, and who knows what would that have done to his stock. But in a draft like this, where a lot of these guys are, are being propped up based off of traits, he's right in the mix. And unlike some of these other guys who don't even have the production to match, at least he has some production. Um, the production isn't great, but it's also, I think, indicative of the fact that he's a red shirt sophomore, right? And, and a guy that's still learning the position. And I just love his motor. I love his length. Um, some people have even tried to comp him to Max Crosby. I don't think he's that. Max Crosby was taller. He was longer. Um, and I, I think Booker, though, has that same kind of motor as a Max Crosby. Boy, does he play hard. <clears throat> you know, I see the bend at, at the top of his rush. Um, I see the explosiveness. What I was most impressed with with him, though, Unlike some of these guys, like Chop Robinson, for instance, who just can't hold a candle in the run game, Austin Booker stood his ground in the run game. He was standing up tackles. He's standing up guards. Uh, he's tossing tight ends aside. He's getting in the backfield. He's making plays. He's disrupting 
you know, the, the structure of runs and, and just being a nuisance on the other side of the line of scrimmage in the run game. He's not just a pass rusher. He can also impact the game as a guy that can get after it in the run game on the opposite side of the line of scrimmage. So um, at 6'4", 240, I, I, I know the size is going to be a question mark for some. I think he can grow a bit more, especially being a redshirt sophomore. Uh, the 40 time was a little disappointing, but guess what? These guys don't get paid to run 40 yards down the field. I'm not tripping about it. I just thought, based off the tape, we would have gotten, you know, four, five, eight. That's what I thought he would run, four, five, eight, four, six, one, something like that. I, I, I didn't see four, eight almost on tape. But I don't care because the explosiveness, the short area quickness is what you look for in edge rushers. And he's got it in spades. Couple that with the hustle and, and the move Rolodex. He's got the Euro step. He's jumping inside. He's using his hands. He's got the spin move. He's got speed to power, although I think that could use a little bit more work. But he's flashed that a little bit as well. He's got a nice little latch and snatch. There's a lot that Austin Booker has going on. And with proper coaching, this guy could be a stud at the next level. So um, he's my number four edge rusher. And for me, um, my comp for him is it's a it's a, a mashup of two guys. Barkevius Mingo, if you remember him, he was a top six pick. I think he was sixth overall to the Browns was Barkevius Mingo, right? And then Jalen Phillips of the Miami Dolphins who has that beautiful Euro step. I think their frames are a lot similar. Mingo, for the explosiveness and the, and the exact size, but I think Mingo wasn't as polished. He was just explosive and dynamic, and people fell in love with that. And I talk about guys like Chop Robinson. Mingo is a great example of a guy that just had all the explosiveness, all the dynamic ability, no skill whatsoever, couldn't hold up against the run, and look what happened to Barkevius Mingo in the NFL. You don't even remember. Most of you probably don't for good reason. Um, Jalen Phillips has developed nicely. It's a shame what happened to him last year with the torn ACL when he was really starting to hit his stride uh, last season. But he's got that Euro step, kind of a similar frame. You know, obviously, uh, Jalen Phillips a little bit bigger than Booker. I think ultimately when Booker becomes a finished product, when he ends up being 255 pounds, which is what Jalen Phillips roughly is, 252, 255, somewhere in that neighborhood. When he's a finished product, he's going to look like Jalen Phillips. And I think he's going to play like Jalen Phillips. It may even be even more explosive and dynamic than Jalen Phillips, even though Phillips tested a lot better than Booker. So um, that's what I see from Austin Booker, you know, a mashup of Barkevius Mingo and, and Jalen Phillips. And I think when it's a finished product, it's probably going to be more like Jalen Phillips. So he's my number four edge rusher out of Kansas. Uh, I think this guy has what it takes to be a, a force at the next level. Now you get into the top three. And my number three guy is Latu Latu. And I really wanted to make him my number one. But I know better. Okay. 6'5", 259 senior out of washington uh, or excuse me ucla 464 40 the most skilled pass rusher in this year's draft class can use uh, he's got a black belt degree in hand usage which you just don't see you know very often coming into the nfl that's going to benefit him greatly at the next level i may add um he's got a nasty euro I think the the coaching staff at UCLA, whomever was teaching those edge rushers, they did a phenomenal job. There's another guy coming out this year in, in uh, the draft as an edge rusher, Gabriel Murphy out of UCLA, who also has a vicious, flavor delicious mm, 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 Euro step where he gets inside of guys and he's very slippery, right? So both of those guys have that same type of trait. Um, the difference is Latu is much bigger, much more physically imposing, can stand up in the run game, set a physical edge. 
um, can use speed to power, and you can move La Latu around. And, and so his ability to get to the quarterback is it's very refreshing. It's fun to watch. And obviously the medical was huge for him at the combine. I think he got a clean bill of health because of the neck injury that he sustained. He, had to, he missed an entire year of college football due to a neck injury. He was not cleared at UW. So he transferred over to UCLA and um, he's really blossomed into a big time pass rusher. And I think the sky's the limit for this guy at the next level because of his skill. He's the most skilled pass rusher in this year's draft by far and away. It's not even close. This guy, what he does works at the NFL level. And there's proof of it. There's so many guys. Like I've seen comps to him of TJ Watt. I I I can't co-sign that, right? But he's not that far away because of Watt's hand usage, Watt's relentlessness and his ability to get to the quarterback and still play the run and be disruptive in that way as well. Um, a lot of people, you know, liken him to TJ Watt. I think that's a bit aggressive, right? Uh, but what I do see is Trey Hendrickson, all right? And even Trey Hendrickson doesn't have the body flow and the silky smoothness of a la to la to in terms of movements. But Trey Hendrickson's hand usage is second to none in the league. And it's that ability coupled with his physicality that allows him to win. And Trey Hendrickson, if I'm not mistaken, was second in the NFL this year in sacks. And he's had three seasons, I think, of over 14 and a half sacks. Has Trey Hendrickson, I think he had 17 and a half this year, only behind TJ Watts 19. So when I tell you that he's Trey Hendrickson, he's not TJ Watt, but he's Trey Hendrickson, the two guys that led the NFL in sacks this season, uh, that goes a long way in telling you how good I think Latu Latu can be at the NFL level. So um, he's number three on my list. One of the few guys that has production and skill to match in this year's draft class. You're not going to find that combination too often in this year's draft class, but Latu Latu has it uh, in spades. So uh, one of my favorite players in this year's draft class all together. Um, get to number two. And it's Dallas Turner, um, the Alabama edge rusher, 6'3", 247-pound junior, uh, running a 4'6", uh, 4, 4, 40. So um, right away, the 4'4", should jump off the screen at you at 6'3", 247, similar to Chop Robinson. The biggest difference is uh, Turner has more bend. He, had, he plays with better leverage and more power. Um, he can be disruptive in the backfield, in the run game now. Um, and he's got some production to match, right? This is a guy that played in the SEC, the toughest conference in football, and he's putting up numbers. So uh, that's the biggest difference. He came in as a freshman right out of the gate and putting up eight sacks. So you already knew what this dude was about. Athletic freak, slippery, slimy, um, has that Gumby type bend to him around the edge that you, you just love to see. Um, I think that he has a chance. He still needs some coaching, right? He's still raw, still doesn't really use his hands the way that I think he could, uh, still doesn't have a rush plan. He's just winning off of pure athleticism. And uh, he's a boomer bust prospect to me because he could easily, easily come in here and be one of these dudes with all of this athletic, you know, prowess and all of these, you know, athletic gifts that he's been blessed with never put it together from a skill standpoint, a rush plan standpoint. And he could just be one of those guys that thinks he's going to come into the NFL and win off of pure uh, explosion and speed. And you get the right tackle in front of you, they shut that shit down, right? But he's different, right? In terms of his explosion and athleticism, it's next level when he's able to hit top gear and he's got the ability to, to bend that corner flat angle, get down to the quarterback. And his closing speed is what separates him from any other uh, edge rusher in this year's draft class. His ability to close once he gets a lane, ridiculous. And so um, he's a problem with that swim move, getting into, knifing into the backfield. He's a problem with that speed that's going to force you to have to open the gate. And then he's he's got the ability to go inside and, and, and take advantage of that gate being open. And so 
Um, you put all those things together, the explosive nature, his ability to do it with his hand in the dirt, standing up, the ability to play the run, be aggressive, get after the quarterback, and then just the things you can't teach, that pure explosiveness, that first step, that four four six, that closing speed. Um, you put all that together. He's got length as well. Uh, Dallas Turner, to me, is the number two edge rusher in this draft class. Um, and the comp isn't really hard. This is low-hanging fruit. I don't care. It's too easy of a comp to deny it. He's, Bri he's Brian Burns coming out of Florida State. He's Brian Burns in the NFL. Now, again, we haven't seen Brian Bur Burns explode yet, to, to me, on an, on an NFL um, stage, really, right? I, I think – Pause. I think he's had one solid NFL season, but um, I don't think we've seen that 14. We I know we haven't seen that 14 and a half sack season from Brian Burns. The Giants are banking on the fact that that's coming down the pipeline, but he could easily, he, I'm talking about Brian Burns, could easily never reach that plateau and he could be a nine and a half you know, sack type guy, which would be okay, but that's not what the Giants are paying him for. And Dallas Turner is going to be drafted, much like Brian Burns was, right in the middle of the first round. I think Burns was the 15th pick in the draft or something along those lines. Um, Dallas Turner is going to be right in that same neighborhood. If not, I think if he gets past eight at Atlanta, he'll find himself somewhere in that mid middle of the first round, 13, 14, 15, somewhere in that neighborhood. So, um, He's Brian Burns. We'll see if he continues to develop and is able to come in the league and tear it up like he did at, in, in the SEC. But all the tools are there. Everything you need for him to turn into a stud at the next level is there. Now it's up to him to take it to that next level, take to coaching, and be a student of the game. He can do that. He'll have a, a, probably the highest upside of anybody in this year's draft class. Uh, and then, of course, you know who number one is, Jared Verse, edge rusher out of Florida State, 6'4", 254 pounds, senior, um, ran a 4'5", 840 at the Combine. Um, Jared Verse, for me, the reason he's number one is because I don't see a way he can fail at the NFL level, barring injuries or anything like that, offsetting his career. If he's healthy... He's at bare minimum going to be a solid six to eight sack a season type of contributor, right? You might not look up and he'll have four or five double digit sack seasons. You may not get that out of him. But what you are going to consistently see throughout his career is in his first season, he had six and a half. In his second season, he had eight. In his third season, he had nine. In his fourth season, he had eight and a half. His fifth season, he had nine and a half. His sixth season, he's got nine again. And then eight, like he's going to be one of those dudes that's going to be hovering it around double digits if he doesn't meet his full potential. That's the kind of play. I think his ceiling and floor are very close together because while he isn't as dynamic and explosive as Dallas Turner or Chop Robinson, um, and he's no, nowhere near as skilled as a Latu Latu or um, uh, some of these other guys in this draft, a, a Gabriel Murphy or one of these other guys. Um, what he is, is he's a brute. He is physical. His hands are heavy. He sets a physical edge. He's a dominant run defender. He can get after you. I've seen him take tackles and put them on their ass. The fat part of their ass off of a straight bull rush. He wasn't looking to go speed to power. He they knew a two-hand bull rush was coming, and their ass was still on skates, holding on for dear life. Okay. He's that kind of physical brute, and it's that kind of physicality that's going to win out for him at the NFL level, but he's still fast enough and explosive enough to beat you with speed. So you have to look for it. And the minute you start clocking that speed. That's when he gets into your chest with that power and they're in the damn thing you can do about it. I've seen him take grown ass men and make them look like little boys with that physicality. And it reminds me of the guy that I'm going to comp him to, which is Khalil Mack. I remember Mack coming out of Buffalo and just the sheer physicality. I remember that Ohio State game, which is probably what got him drafted top five that year. 
um, that Ohio State game where he just went ape shit on the Ohio State Buckeyes, taking guys, tossing them out of the club, taking tight ends, walking them back 12 yards into the backfield. And what we've seen from Khalil Mack throughout the course of his career is can't block him with a tight end. He's a lead against the run. He's physical. Hands are heavy. And that's everything that explains what Jarrett Verse is all about. Physicality, heavy hands, the ability to be a, a physical monster up front, enough speed to threaten the edge, to get you looking for that. And in the minute you do, that's when you get the power and you're not ready for it. And the consistency with which he played in his collegiate career, the same thing I'm telling you. I think there was a, a six, an eight, and a nine, you know, an eight and a half, a nine and a half. That's what he's going to be at the next level potentially. And, and if he maxes out and he's able to, to learn how to use his hands a little bit better, um, develops maybe a spin or a counter, because really he doesn't need a counter because the counter is the power, right? The speed outside threatens enough to where you look for it and then the power is the counter. So if he just masters that, he's a problem already. Get, get one more move. Learn how to use your hands. And he's a double-digit guy at that point. And that's why, for me, uh, Jarrett versus number one, because he won't fail at the NFL level. He won't fail. I can't say the same thing for Dallas Turner. I can't say that Latu Latu, you know, will be successful. I think he will. I feel really good. I'd bet money that he will. But I can't say that with 100% certainty, barring injury, if he's healthy, Latu Latu is going to succeed. I can't say that Austin Booker, who I love, one of my favorite players in this draft, along with Latu Latu, um, is going to succeed. I can't tell you that either of the Robinsons are going to succeed. I'm telling you right now, Jarrett Verse is going to succeed. O on what level? That I can't say. Will he ever be elite or dominant? Maybe, maybe not. Who's to say? But I can tell you what he'll be. He'll be. Preston Smith from a statistical standpoint. Let's look at what Preston Smith's done throughout his career. And I bet you um, it's the same type of thing that I was um, talking about from a statistical standpoint. So Preston Smith, rookie season, eight sacks. Second season, four and a half sacks. Third season, eight sacks. Fourth season, four sacks. Then goes to Green Bay, 12 and a half sacks. The next uh, 12 sacks, which is a career high, that's the only season he's had double digits, right? Next season after the 12, uh, four sacks. Then nine sacks in 2021. Eight and a half sacks the next year. And then eight sacks a season ago. That's what Jarrett Verse is going to be, right? May not knock your socks off with this ridiculous production like Latu Latu may do, where he's going to have multiple 14, 13 and a half, 16 one year type seasons or Dallas Turner could have if he, you know, morphs into Brian Burns 2.0 and actually, you know, develops a game and, and ends up being this dynamic edge rusher. That may never be Jared Burst, but what he is going to be is a consistent quarterback bagger. Year in, year out, you know you can pencil him in if he's healthy for eight, anywhere from seven to nine sacks on the season, similar to Preston Smith. Um, Khalil Mack is my my comp because if he maxes out his abilities, he'll turn into Khalil Mack and he'll be a guy that'll be getting double digit sacks on a regular basis. So um, that's my list of edge rushers. So let's get to the comment section and see what you guys have to say um, about this list. Video channel. Thank you for the super chat. Greatly appreciate you. Thank you for kicking us off. Thank you for being a member of the MOBB who writes, Lou, big dog. What's going on, video channel? Watched your video earlier. That field trip was at Top Golf. <laughs> AP did the same thing in San Francisco, but we have to let these guys work, trust the process. Can also find out more at an off site. So I'm not tripping about it. I was just a little perplexed as to what was going on. Um, you know, afterwards, 
come to find out this is a, a, a ploy that they've used in the past in San Francisco. And again, a lot of the things that he's brought over to Washington, they did in San Francisco. So uh, knowing what I know now, I'm, I'm not surprised they're doing it. I don't know the level of effectiveness behind this because, you know, I saw people arguing about, well, you know, w- w- what's the results? And somebody's like, well, they got Brock Purdy. And I'm like, that, like, don't think for one second that they they meant to have Brock Purdy be the guy that he turned into. Like, stop, okay? They got lucky. They stumped. They, if they thought Brock Purdy was that good, they would not have drafted him as the very last player in the NFL draft, okay? So miss me with that. You, the, the more comparable app would be Trey Lance, right? And if they did that same thing with Trey Lance, and again, it's not like Trey Lance sucks like, like Zach Wilson does, where we can clearly say he played and he just isn't very good. Trey Lance's career has been marred by injuries, and so we still don't know if he's any good or not. We can't say that he stinks and that was a bad decision. He just got injured. And then Brock Purdy did what he did, and it is what it is, right? All I know is I'm going to trust the process, and I told you all that in the video earlier. I don't know what the hell they're doing. I don't necessarily this, – this is also something I know. I don't know what they're doing, but all I care about is results. And if it works, great. I'm on board and I'm all for it. My thing is what we have been doing here hasn't worked, okay? I do know that with 100% certainty. None of that has worked. And with that said, I'm open to any and everything at this point, okay? Nothing is out of bounds for me. Just caught me off guard a little bit. That's all. Wasn't accustomed to seeing, you know, a class trip, essentially, where everybody's invited. At least separate the quarterbacks from the rest of the group and give them their own time. But they no, everybody's coming. So it's all good. If that's what they want to do, I'm not tripping about it. I hope it works. I hope it works. But I'm going to trust the process because, again, Everything that we did here in Washington over the last 25 years was a mess. None of it worked. So I'm open for new, fresh, and innovative ideas. Because clearly the the old, stale shit that we were doing for the last uh, quarter of a century wasn't getting the job done. So do whatever it is you feel like you need to do. I need this to turn into a winner. And I, I, (laughs) I I had to laugh at myself. Because every time I talk, I, I you know, and they, it comes out of nowhere sometimes. But I get passionate because I want to win so bad, right? And at this point, I'm open to whatever is going to get us not just to win fast, but win consistently. I'm not looking for the flash in the pan. I want, I want sustained excellence. That's what I'm after. And today, for some reason, I don't even know what prompted this. I just snapped. (laughs) I don't know if you caught that in the video, but I just went off and I didn't even see it coming. Normally, I know when I'm about to go off, right? I can feel it. Or somebody has to say something that prompts me to then go off. I was just talking and all of a sudden, I just snapped. And I had one of those, I don't care, I just want to win type of rants. I I just want to win. That's what I want so badly, so desperately. And I think this group is going to deliver. I really do. Like, I haven't felt this good about anything since Gibbs 2.0. You know, there was a brief fleeting moment where Shanahan felt like it could work in 2012. Then Robert goes down. And from that moment on, it was never the same. Never the same. This I feel like this could work, but we gotta we gotta see what all of this you know manifests itself into. But I'm excited. Gonna trust the process for sure. Um, Justin Evans, been a member for four months. Really appreciate you, my guy. Justin writes, "Hey Lou, appreciate you waiting for the late show. I, I something told me it was gonna be a good game. I didn't want to interrupt and shit. I wanted to watch it my damn self. And I'm glad that I did wait because boy was that an entertaining game." Sucks that Zion couldn't make it to the finish line because I really, truly believe I would have gotten my wish. 
I was this close. I was I was over here singing some Ray J. If I had one wish, and I I was this close to getting it. <laughs> and then Zion does whatever he did to his leg, and he couldn't finish. And if he finishes this game, I don't know if the Pellies win. The Lakers might still win the game. But with the way that he was taking the ball to the cup, they couldn't stop him. He already had a forty piece, and. The beauty of what he was doing was he also was playing LeBron one-on-one. So there was no mismatch. And I felt like they were able to create mismatches late in the game. LeBron was able to get matchups against Alvarado or they got the switch on, um, I forgot the the tall, light-skinned kid that they brought in for defensive purposes late in the game. Um, Tyson something or something Tyson. Whatever his damn name is, it still is a mismatch. LeBron still has him by, you know, six, you know, five, six inches shot right over him on one of those uh, shots. It was a tough shot, but he still made it. With Zion, he's not getting that same shot, that same look. Um, and then they both went to block LeBron's shot, and nobody boxed out AD, which is unfortunate. But um, I'm I was really surprised, and I know the Pellies have been playing good ball without. Um, without Brandon Ingram, but no B.I. down the stretch. Very surprising. I know he just came back, and he wasn't having a great game. He had a great start to the game, but really surprised they didn't go to him down the stretch because C.J. McCollum was sucking ass in this game, and to go back to him, and I get it. He had been playing really well, and and unfortunately, when they needed him the most, um, he came up with his worst game probably in the last two weeks, but still, he was ass tonight couldn't hit the backside of a damn barn, I would have gone to B.I. to hell with, with C.J. McCollum because he won't hit on a damn thing. But it was a very entertaining game. I knew the Lakers were going to beat them. I told you, you can't ask the Pellies to do shit. Um, and so now I, I think the NBA is going to get what they want because I think the Warriors are going to get in now, uh, especially if Zion's down. Um, whomever wins this game, uh, Warriors and Kings probably going to beat the the Pellies if Zion has an injury that is going to keep him out of that game. They don't stand a chance without him, especially with B.I. still not where they need him to be. So the NBA is probably going to get their wish, sneak Golden State and the Lakers in the back uh, end of this Western Conference playoffs. I don't know if it's going to make for a great series, though. I think OKC is going to wipe the floor with Golden State. Or Sacramento really doesn't matter. And the Lakers, I don't think they wanted the smoke. They just wanted the time off, right? Ensure that they're in the playoffs, get the time off. But they didn't want the Nuggets. They didn't want that smoke, but they don't they didn't have a choice. LeBron's still dealing with a bum ankle. He's 90 years old. You don't want to play again on Thursday and then have to turn around and then play on Saturday, right? Win on Tuesday. Now you got two days off before you hit the practice. Um, to hit the gym for practice and um, get ready for the Nugs. So this time off is going to be huge for a, an older roster like the Lakers. Uh, big win for them. Thought they would get it done. Now let's see what happens in this 9-10 matchup. Christopher McLaughlin, thank you for the super chat. Greatly appreciate you. Thank you for being a member of the MOBB. My guy, Chris, once again, thank you for your generosity. Greatly appreciate you, my guy, Chris writes, hey, Lou, what's up, Chris? Hope all is well with you and the family. Likewise, as always, hope you and the fam are doing great, wonderful, and splendid. He writes, two questions. One, how aggressive is Peters getting an edge rusher in day two for the future, having consistent pass rush issues? Two, with John Allen turning 30 next year, is it time to look for a future defensive tackle next to Payne? I've already said that if there was a stud defensive tackle sitting there staring you in the face at the top of the second round, I would go ahead and make the move. Um, I've been adamant about that. I don't know if Peter sees it the same way, but that that's just the way I would attack it. Right. Um, Cause I think Braden Fisk, there's a chance that Bra- both Braden Fisk and um, the Illinois defensive tackle, Johnny Newton are both there. 
I'm pretty sure that they're both going to be there. Now, one of those two may not, because Byron Murphy is definitely going in the first round, and he may have some company. You know, one of those guys. I don't see both of those guys going in the first round, but one of those two guys may. But there's a chance that both of those guys, with Newton being injured and not really being able to work out during this, this um, you know, draft process, that could drop his stock. And I think Braden Fitz was always a fringe first round guy, but more likely to be a second round pick. So at the end of the day, um, I'd be very interested in either one of those dudes, but I don't know if he sees it the same way. I mean, if you think about defensive tackle in particular with this team, that's pretty far down the list of, um, I wouldn't even call it a need at this point, but it's pretty far down the list of things you need to do. But I, I told you, I'm not about, you know, capturing needs and, and taking care of quote unquote needs. I'm trying to get better as a football team and adding talent is how you get better as a football team. You figure the rest out later, just get the best football players that your picks can can get you. And I think those defensive tackles are going to be of significant value towards the top of the second round. I, I, I do have a declaration for you guys real quick, and then I'm going to get to the rest of your comment, Chris. I just need to say this before I forget it because um, I will forget. I got a guarantee for you guys. I guarantee you that if Washington doesn't trade back into the first round, and I may have said this already, so I, pardon me if I have. Charge it to my, my head, not my heart. All right. If Washington doesn't trade back into the first round and they obviously won't have a tackle at that point at 36 and Jordan Morgan, the tackle out of Arizona is still there. I guarantee you Washington selects Jordan Morgan at 36. Bet I'd bet just about any amount of money that that takes place. So I'll say this once again. If Washington doesn't double back, go back into the first round for anything, doesn't necessarily even have to be a tackle. It could be an edge rush. It could be a tight end. We've, we've had those discussions already, but the likelihood is if they're going back into the first round, it's for protection for that quarterback that they selected number two overall. If they don't find themselves going back up into the first round to get said tackle, and they get to 36, their first pick, the first of two in the second round, and tackle Jordan Morgan out of Arizona is there. I guarantee they take him. I'll say this. I told you I'm not the biggest Jordan uh, Morgan fan, and I'm not the biggest fan of guys coming off of injuries, you know, ACL tears, things of that nature, but he, he was able to successfully return in 20. 23 and played well so hopefully that's behind him uh but watching these edge rushers the best edge rushers resided in the the pac 12 hands down no questions asked this year if you're going through my list um there are one two three four Five, five of my top 15 are Pac-12 edge rushers. So I think no other conference has three. Um, because Penn State has two in the Big Ten. And I think that's it for the Big Ten. So Alabama has two. And then Chop Robinson makes it three, or uh, Darius Robinson, excuse me, makes it three um, for the uh, SEC. So the Pac-12 had five of the top edge rushers in the draft. So to me, it was so easy to watch Arizona tape over and over again because when you started watching these guys, how did they do against Jordan Morgan? How did they do against Arizona? And um, Morgan, for the most part, held his own. My biggest knock on Jordan Morgan, and I think I said this uh, when I broke down the tackles in the draft, 
But my biggest knock on him is he doesn't anchor well. You can get in, in, into his pads, you can bull rush him, and you can put him on skates a bit. Now, uh, a lot of times he stops the bleeding eventually before you ultimately push him into the quarterback. But it, it's going to spook a quarterback. If I'm standing back there and out of my peripheral, out of the corner of my eye, I just see my guy getting walked back. I'm going to move. I'm going to run. I'm going to step up. I'm going to flush backwards. And it's going to destroy the timing of the play. Um, too often, he is not able to stand his ground and anchor down. Now, that quickness shit, he's athletic enough to play that game with you. If you want to try to win, turn in the corner, he just push your ass up the field. I've seen him win in these athletic matchups with these guys with skill. I've watched him win a ton. Um, I've seen guys get into his chest, though. But I'm just telling you right now, if Washington doesn't double back into the first round, they haven't taken a tackle yet, and Jordan Morgan's on the board at 36, we're taking him. Um, you also asked um, – how aggressive is Peters getting an edge rusher in day two for the future, uh, having consistent pass rush issues? I think that he's shown us through these visits and what we've been told, and, and we're going to put this theory to test this year, right? Because all of this is brand new to us. Chef P is new to us. So we don't know what to expect. But what we've been told from those in the know from San Francisco is that when they bring guys in, for visits. And this isn't for show, right? This isn't for, oh, let me talk to you about some of the red flags or some of the issues that we had with you, like the last regime liked to do. Now, nah, we bringing your ass in here because we believe that you can help this football team. And we just want to dot our I's, cross our T's, and make sure you check all the boxes. We want to draft you. If that's the case, they've already shown us where their head is at from an edge rushing standpoint. So I think the guy that they're willing to spend a high level pick on, meaning 36 or 40, is Chop Robinson, okay? That's the guy they're willing to spend, you know, 36 or 40 on. If he's there, and there's a chance that he could be there at 36. And even if he gets to the second round, Washington could get antsy and say, all right, let's just move up to 34 and get him, right? Let's move up to 33 with Carolina just to ensure that we get our guy. Because there may be some action for Trop Robinson at the top of this. You know, that th those first few picks of the second round are very valuable because your other team's GMs have a night to rest and sleep on what just transpired. And now they know what the board looks like. They know who's available. And now you can get aggressive. Oh, shit. We didn't expect this guy to be here. Let's pick up the phone and call Carolina. Let's pick up the phone and call New England and see if we can't get up in front of Washington or X, Y, Z. So you never know. Washington could be a little bit aggressive in going up. But I think at 36, they'd be willing to spend uh, or 40. Because I, I still think that if it's between Chop Robinson and, and Jordan Morgan, they're taking Jordan Morgan. I'm not, I'm not backing off of that. I, I am guaranteeing that if Jordan Morgan is there at 36, he is the pick. Now, <clears throat> they've already kind of told us with the, the way that they've set up their um, top 30, they've got guys at stages of, of the draft, right? All of their profiles look very similar, including Marshawn Nealon, who uh, they're going to meet with as well, or they may have already met with him. Um, all of these guys are athletic. You can move them around, you know, they offer some dynamic ability and they present problems up front because you don't know, you know, where they're going to line up and how they're going to rush. But all of these guys are in different stages of the draft. So Chop Robinson for me, French first rounder could be there early second. Um, if he's not there or, you know, somebody takes him or they, they go in a different direction, um, because the board is set up in a way where, oh, we got to get this player or this player, we didn't expect him to be there. They have him higher than Chop Robinson. They pass on Robinson. You get to the third round, Austin Booker is now in play, right? I think with your three third rounders, a guy like Austin Booker is in play. Um, I think Marshawn Nealon at, at the back end, I think Booker is more towards the front, you know, 67, 78. I think... Neyland is more towards the back of the third round, that hundredth overall pick. 
if you don't do anything and you just have stand pat and have those three selections. Um, Nealon is closer to the you know back end of the third into the fourth. We don't have a fourth round pick, obviously. So if you want one of those guys, you'd have to take them in the third round. And then if you don't get Nealon, Booker, or Chop Robinson, they've shown that uh, John Baptiste out of Notre Dame is a guy that you'll you'll have an opportunity to get in the fifth round where we have two selections. So they've shown us that they're prioritizing edge rusher. They they're, they're just going to see how the board falls in order to know how they're going to attack it. But I think he's prioritizing it. And again, I told you, don't be fooled by the amount of activity at defensive end. We had none. Okay. We had none. So they had to be aggressive unless you count Andre Jones Jr. And KJ Henry, we had no edge rushers coming in to this process. Just two guys that were rookies a season ago who didn't show any ability to be anything other than, you know, fringe roster backups, right? Guys that are barely hanging on to the roster. Neither one of those guys showed me enough that they have to be on the team this year, okay? So <clears throat> them signing four guys was literally them replenishing what was a Fully bare covered. Okay. And but keep in mind, they only signed one guy to a long-term deal. The rest of these guys, Dante Fowler Jr., Cleveland Farrell, F.A. Ovada, all one year deals. So understand that you'll be right back in this same position next year if you don't draft a guy. So I expect them to take a guy. And the beauty of taking a guy this year is that if you take an Austin Booker who may not be ready to like contribute on an every down snap in snap, snap out basis at six, four and a half 240, you want him to bulk up to 252 and he could do that by next year, but he can still be on the field, right? In, in certain uh, packages and situations, situationally, you can get him on the field, but to have him play first, second, third down, he's not ready to do that. You don't have to do that in year one, right? So you can draft him. You can have him learn. You can have him get in the weight room, get stronger, not lose the athleticism. And then next year, he'll be ready to start opposite of Dorrance Armstrong. And I, I think that's the mindset of, you know, what you can do with a guy like Austin Booker or even a Chop Robinson, right? Um, so we'll see. I think they are pri prioritizing um, Edge rusher, though. I really do think they are. G more, baby. Stand up. You are the newest member of the MOBB. Greatly appreciate you. Mob, y'all know what to do. Show G more, baby, some love. Welcome him with open arms. Um, let him know what it's like to be a member of the squad. Welcome aboard, G more, baby. Glad to have you with the MOBB. So, um, that is the show for tonight, essentially. I've given you my top seven edge rushers for the 2024 NFL Draft. It's an interesting group of edge rushers. Uh, like I said, um, there's a healthy mix of guys with tons of raw ability, but not the skill that you would like, nor the production to match. Um, there are some guys that have some skill, have a little bit of production. That gets you a little excited. There's some guys that don't necessarily fit the traits mold uh, like a Muhammad Kamara. Doesn't fit the prototypical NFL edge rusher. Doesn't have the length, doesn't have the size, but he's a worker bee. He's a guy that is relentless. He has an athletic profile. He has the production to match. Does that trump the lack of length and the lack of size and you know the, the lack of um, – you know, like a, a true game, right? Because he's more of a brute force, um, you know, try hard, secondary rush, you know, relentless second effort sack guy, right? He cleans up those sacks. Some team may fall in love with that, you know? Some team may fall in love with that. So anyway, I digress. Uh, that's going to do it for me, your man, Louis T., Looking forward to chopping it up with you tomorrow on the Louis T Network podcast. Probably we'll do that at night tomorrow as well. Uh, kind of let these um, do it in, in this, probably in the same window 
allow that first game to take place, come on afterwards, and then jump in right in the middle of that uh, that interlude between the first game and the second game. So that's probably what we'll do. And then uh, we have thir- – and then we'll be back Thursday for – the command post is going to be a big show on Thursday night. I'll spill the beans as to the contents of what uh, Thursday night show will be all about tomorrow on the podcast. So make sure you tune in to the Louis T Network podcast tomorrow so you will know what Thursday's show is going to be all about. It's going to be a fun one. You want to be there for that because we're going to have a hell of a time. But Uh, That's going to do it for me, your man Louis T, here on the Command Post. You know what it is. Post up. Take command. Until next time, you guys, have a good one. Take care. Enjoy the rest of your evening, and I will see you guys tomorrow. God bless. Good night.